Hey folks, welcome to The Hang. On this episode, we're hanging with my good friend, Jonathan Rocksmith. Jonathan and I met way back in the day in uh, Hong Kong when we crossed paths with Vita the Musical as I stepped into the role of Che, which he was brilliantly doing on the world tour before and after me. And uh, we hit it off, we became great friends, and we've reacquainted with each other here in New York City while he's here creating, uh, let's say, a, a new life for himself as well as opening more doors because he's an incredible artist, he's a prolific man, and I just love spending time with him, and I'm sure you will as well. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. The back row. The back row. What's wrong with the back row? I'm not going to see you from there. The seats at the August Wilson right to the back row are great. And with your height, no problem. That makes no sense in terms of physics. That makes no sense. Into, what you just said is absolute balls. It's great seats. What is the theater underground? Is that being high? What, what does that even mean? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Thanks. Jonathan Rocksmith, welcome to The Hang. Thank you. Already making fun of me. That is makes us both hung? I don't know. What does that mean? We'll be hung by the end. <laughs> That's the way you started. That's the way you started. Yeah. You brought it up. <laughs> no, not one guest has ever made that. Then you haven't had the right people on here. Except Laird. Laird, Except he's Laird. wonderful. But he still didn't say that. No, he's a gentleman. <laughs> You're like a modern Oscar Wilde. <laughs> <laughs> that's not, that's not nice. That's never nice. Why is that not nice? He's smart. He's intelligent. He's witty. Stephen Fry played him in the movie. I didn't say you look like Oscar Wilde. And Stephen <laughs> Fry doesn't look like Oscar Wilde. How did he get away with no, it? He's, he's, he's got a very big brain, Stephen Fry. As do so you. That's fine. Well, we're trying. So welcome to New York City. Yeah, it's a bit crazy. It's a bit You've mad. been here how long now? Six weeks. It's been six I've weeks? I've been here for six weeks. Man, that's gone fast. Mm. Yeah. When we got together that night where I lost my wallet, or got, I think I might have been pick, pit pocketed. Do you know what? As, as you mentioned it the other day, I just thought, I wonder if... Because we went through two big groups of people where we were in the way, remember? Of course. And I thought, maybe that's... Well, do you know what? They deserve to have it because they were very good. They were, yeah. I didn't feel an old bump and grind. No, but it was... Yeah, I mean, it was just talk about a reunion of sorts. The first time we get into a bar and then... I thought you were joking when you when you texted afterwards. I was like, there's no ways. He's just... It's, it was a big jacket. You were wearing a big jacket. Um... But I just felt bad for you because your ID. That's the only thing. And, also and driver's the, license. But it, all that can be replaced. But the actual card holder was sentimental to me. Mm. Um, so six weeks and you're here because you want to get a green card? Well, I have my green card. Congratulations. Thank you. In the mail. Like it wasn't, I thought it would be a, a, arrive like on the back of an eagle or something. You know, something really American and really <laughs> fantastic. Just USPS. There you go. Do you have to be here? It's, yeah. Ideally, I think you get into the country and it takes about three, four weeks to print it and then they send it to you and you need to collect it or accept it. So that's how they double check that you are still in the country. Um, but I mean, as much as I joke about it, it was a weirdly emotional thing. I bet, yeah. Because, you know, I, growing up in South Africa, this is the place that you're kind of taught from a young age. Unless you come here, you haven't really made it in this career. Do you believe that though? I don't know about believe it, but there's too much. There's too much to the contrary to not take that seriously, in terms of building a sustainable career mm -hmm. as you get older, as well. Um, Which you know that's far off for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for instance, Amra Amra Faye Wright, who is the longest running Velma in Chicago, she's one of ours. You know, Aren't she's she? she's South African. She came here sort of late 90s, early 2000s. And um, she kind of made us realize it was possible. And that I think is kind of the, not just the, the goal, but if you are in a position where you can get here and make it work, you sort of give someone else a little bit more encouragement mm -hmm. to do it as well. Um, because I think we're, as people, we, we need to see someone else do it first. Because bravery in the arts is so rare on that level, because you're moving to a different country. Yeah, and when you say we need to say, you mean South Africans? South Africans right. in particular, yeah. Um, and I think there's also something in a South African mindset that um, 
in order to be a successful South African, you have to make it somewhere else, not in your own country. Mm. There's this, I've always, I mean, there are going to be South Africans who write in to me on Instagram and say, what are you talking about? But from my experience, it's certainly, we don't have that kind of um, pride. Uh, we've, we've done too many things wrong, I think, in some instances. And in the arts, to be able to come to New York, you are able to go back home and show all the other people who, who want the same thing that you do, that it is possible. Um, I, I had a session once with, um, do you remember Trevor Jackson course, at Cameron's man. office? He came to South Africa and afterwards he said, you know, when you do work overseas, um, you should come back and share what you learn. And I, initially I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to just stay overseas. I, like I'm, I, I got out, I'll stay out. Mm. But he said, but the whole point is, you learn things here that you could only learn here, but shouldn't be exclusive to here. So he said, well, take it home when you, when you learn it. So this trip alone, I like a bunch of my friends, I'm going to say, right, you're coming over. I need to tell you a few things because all very well having these dreams, but you've got to be able to defend them. Because if you're going to dream about being a performer in New York, you've got to be so specific about what kind of performer you're going to be. Because those three hours a day that you're at the theater, that's great. What about the other 21? Right. Where you're going to live, where you're going to eat, where you're going to do your laundry, where you're going to do this, where you're going to do that. All of those things that are not part of the degree when you're studying. Right. So that's what's been really good about this trip. I want to unpack that more. So I guess I want to say, well, talk more about that. I mean, I'm, <laughs> talk more about well, that. I'm, what a host. What a host here. Graham Norton has nothing on you. <laughs> talk well, more about that. I want you to that. unpack more of what you're saying because I didn't fully understand. So you're saying... With the rest Why are you of the blushing, time. though? I don't understand. What's going on? Because <laughs> I get nervous around people who are smarter than me. Lol. <laughs> so all I mean by that is I think when you are driven by a passion, you give that that goal. Yeah, I wanted to know what you meant by defend. That's what I meant. Why should you have that dream? How much about that dream do you know to have that dream? Or is it just a blind thing because I'm passionate about it and that's the correct thing to say? In so many instances in the arts and musical theater, um, people sound like their phones are ringing, so you don't really know what to do. <laughs> Good. I don't know who that could be. That's, that's a guest. Oh, his lunch. My oh. producer ordered lunch. And here we are. You give them food? But, yeah, we have to. Um, you know, unions. Yeah, he's not even listening, but he, when he gets back, I'm probably going to come back with like a robot voice. Or Don't something. you cut this. <laughs> <laughs> so, But do you feel you need to defend? No. When I say that, I mean, all right, you're allowed to have a dream, but what kind of a dream is it? Be very specific about it. Right. And like, if you want that dream, you have to be willing to defend it to other people who are going to say, oh, but don't you want to get a real job or something like that? I get you. And I find the way that you can defend it best is, is say, yes, I want to be on, sorry, I want to be on Broadway. But what that means is X, Y, and Z. Not just the show. The show mm. is, that should be a given that you can do all those things. Right. Can you be a New Yorker? Can you walk on the, on the curb with New Yorkers whose, no, sole, whose sole goal is to get somewhere and you're in their way? Do you know how to order a coffee? Do you know how to hail a cab? All those little things that may seem second place or like unnecessary to, to a New Yorker, but to someone who's not, and South Africans by nature are quite self-deprecating and apologetic, and you get to a city where you're in my way. I watched that great um, docu-series with Fran Leibovitz and um, uh, Martin Scorsese. Yeah. Pretend it's a city. And that's the best advice you can give anybody who comes here. Pretend people live here, you know, not just a tourist. Right. And I think when you add that kind of um, permission that a goal or a dream has over you to just spit you out, like you've got to be very clear on what that dream means for you. Yeah, and I guess I can relate and We to don't that. think about that. Hmm. Because, well, I'm passionate, therefore I'm owed and I'm entitled it to come true and it'll all fall into place. No, it's not how it works. And that's not me being jaded. It's just having been around here now for a decent amount of time um, and not just two weeks where I'm in a theater every night yeah. um, and having stayed in different areas around the city, the, the big overarching thing that I've learned is if you're going to come here, you need to have a plan that is so clear. Don't just come here and say, I'll, I'll see how it goes. 
It's not how it works here anymore. And I don't know if that's a post-COVID thing, but certainly you want to be on Broadway. Great. As what? Uh, well, my dream show is Wicked. Great. Who do you want to be? Um, already it's wrong. Because it's just, I want to be on Broadway. It's such an open, it's like young. But what about giving time to people process it? Just like you making fun of my hosting skills. I wanted to process skills. what I wanted, skills. What I wanted to um, ask you. <laughs> And I'm glad I did, because now I understand. Unbelievable. My producer not only stopped. You're the audio man. He's taking the salad out of a paper bag. No, we're leaving this in. Do not cut this out. Yeah. Just like his insulting me. Yeah. You got to keep that in. Um, but I'm glad we did it, because what I my takeaway now is, is having intention, being on purpose. Oh, yeah. It's like, because I've never been, I, this is my third time for a long stint here in New York. Most lost I've ever been. But I think I've always been brought here. I'm doing the show. But my my purpose of like, as you say, beyond the show, do I like New York City? Do I like living in New York City? What is my identity here? That's I exactly can't fully it. answer that yet. I'm getting there now with like re revelations I've had over the last couple of weeks. Because I'm like, why well, I feel more lost than ever. Yeah. And I've got so much to be grateful for. Don't get me wrong. Oh, but that doesn't come into it. The gratitude part, quite frankly, should be a given. Every it's morning. The, it's the practical side of it. Because a lot of people studying to go into the arts these days, um, things I've been hearing a lot is, oh, I want to be a star. What does that mean? Well, what nowadays. does that mean? That's not a profession. Star is not a profession. Um, performer, storyteller, you know, that... Tell me what that actually means. Because if you know what that means, you know what it takes to be there and you know what you need in order to survive on the downtime to service that function. I was at Some Like It Hot last night and Christian Borel comes out of the stage door. Well, on the side of the theater. He didn't do stage door. He went out the side and uh, cut off T-shirt, jeans, on his phone with a protein shake. He had places to be because he has a 3D life yeah. outside of the theater. And I think figuring that part of it is more important than establishing the dream in the first place. That I, I do. Do you know what I mean? And not so being defend apologetic, your dream. And not being apologetic about it. Exactly. Because you have to like take care of yourself. You have to have a 3D, well-rounded life. And you have to figure that out. And yeah. I, I post-pandemic, and I, I don't really like keep talking about it, but I'm like, I'm feeling the effects of it now. Mm. And the sort of like... Ooh, what, what's your purpose, what's your calling, what's your, yeah, calling is the main thing because, you know, we have desires and the, your wants, but then you end up doing something like, well, that's your calling. Mm -hmm. Every time I have plans, I find myself, but actually I've been doing this. And you almost have no say over that. It just happens. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I, everybody wants to get into that whole thing about post pandemic and the minute that you say the PP word, it's like, Oh, here we go. I know. But it's not fashionable to say that good things came of it. It's not popular because a lot of people close to me, I lost a lot of people because of it. So for me to say that it seems counterintuitive, but in terms of re-entering this profession where our sole function is to recreate human behavior, if you think about it, you can only do that if you're a decent human being and you have something that, Theater used to define me, and I was my job, and therefore when my job wasn't there, who am I? And so much so that, you know, the theater side of things kept going from strength to strength, and this and that role, and that tour, and that world tour, whatever. And then you, you, the show would finish, and you go back to your, your hotel room, and then? Mm. So I'm glad I went through that before I came here, because I think if I'd have come to New York... 2018, um, I would have been on the first flight home after two weeks. Right. But here, I think because I've, I've been more lonely during this trip than any other trip I've ever had, because this is a stark reality here. It is a tough city. It's, it's one of the best cities in the world, don't get me wrong. But take Broadway and put it aside, which I never thought I'd say. Put it aside. And then... Mm -hmm. And that's why if, you, if you're going to come and, and do this performing thing here, there's so much more to it than what they teach you and what they tell you. We are so accustomed, I think, because of, you know, talent shows on television that make it seem like anybody can do it and it's all wonderful and it's, it's fab for everybody. Um, I think it's given us a completely fake artificial idea 
of what this takes, you know? And I'm not trying to be philosophical at all. It's just that's what has come to light here. And the people who are the most successful don't live for their job. That's funny you should say that. That's Do you know something what I mean? I've I was just listening to yesterday, Robert Downey Jr. talking about it on a clip I saw, and it's about letting go, letting go of not not chasing something. It's just being ready. Yeah. Showing up, being ready, because you got to let go, because whether it's for people, God, universe, spiritual, mm. whatever you want to align yourself with for your calling, your purpose, and just your structure in life, there's only so much you can do oh, apart yeah. from just being on purpose. You can't necessarily, like, I can't force a film to hire me or a TV show or the next musical. Mm. Next thing you know, all these things line up, and I'm like, ah, I guess that's my calling. I need to be there. That's where I'm meant to be. Yeah. For that moment. And then things that happen on the peripheral to that job, you realize that's what you had to sort of go through. Yeah. But and that doesn't identify who I am. No, the job doesn't. No. But the after effects and the people that you meet and the person that you are. Uh, inspired to become that's kind of what I look at that and I go well I fundamentally don't believe in coincidence I don't think that's a thing I agree um, I do believe in timing and I was watching um, I think it's um, one of the Broadway sites I uh, had an interview with Jay Harrison G I'm a bit obsessed with some like it hot I don't know if you can tell but he they You've asked twice, him, right yeah yeah um, they said, are you, are you overwhelmed by being a Tony nominee? Blah. And he said, no, this is exactly what I gave my life, um, what I gave my control up to be driven to. I was willing to put in the work and, and everything. And this has happened exactly how I wanted it to happen. I just had to let go and let it happen. And yeah. I was just like, that's, I think that's such a good way of um, doing it. It's, it's a, the relinquishing of control. And when you're a control freak, uh, it's, it's hard. Because you want to have every, you want to have the, um, uh, you want to give the permission every step of the way, and the okay for everything, but it has almost nothing to do with you, and I think that's being here. And I was like, oh, that's what I have to take away from this. And I think I think that goes back to like it's not about the results, is it? It's the process, and I'm trying to learn by every morning. I do my daily affirmations and gratitude, which is the gratitude I've always done, but daily affirmations and. Mm. Being kind to myself has actually been... That's hard, though. Super hard. Yeah, because we're also taught, don't be arrogant, don't be self-serving, don't be contrived, don't be conceited, all these things. So you don't ever want to put too much time focusing on you because there's such a negative connotation. And I think there are some bad examples out there of people who've taken that way too far. Um, but you also don't realize what not doing that can do to you. Of course, you're a well, and if the well is dry, nobody drinks. So you, you if you have people yeah. you're taking care of and you want to be giving as artists, of course we want to give. We want to tell yeah. stories. We want to give ourselves every night so people take that away. So you have to put yourself first when it comes to self-care. Mm. But mean, then they also glorify being exhausted. How are you today? Oh, I'm, I'm working so hard. I'm so tired. Oh, wow. And there's that sort of uh, praise yeah. for burnout. I'm like, no. No. I was just listening to a podcast in the gym this morning and it said exhaustion is not a sign of, what was it? No, exhaustion is not a sign of success or like you've completed. It doesn't, it's not necessarily a great mm. thing. You don't have to be exhausted. And as you say, to glorify that. Mm. Look, some cultures do. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't really include that in this. But what I'm saying is when people want to post things like um, such a, such a long week. I'm 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 burnt out. I, I you know I need to recoup. I you know. Um, well, why are they posting that? That's the point. This exhaustion signaling is is bizarre to me, because sometimes yeah you do feel at the end of a long week and you spent there is some satisfaction that comes from that. And then you have a day off and you recharge and everything. But it's become fashionable that your default is I'm absolutely exhausted. Listen, but those people are their jobs. Yeah. More often than not. And I think that's the, again, I don't want people to come after me. That's not mutually exclusive. But I'm seeing so many people do that now, thinking that it gives them permission for certain things. And I just, I don't know, just, 
I think you can have it both ways. You can do a great job and look after yourself. 100%. You know, so... I'm learning. I, I burnt myself out this year. Well, last year for sure, because I was... It's that line Nikki Arnstein says every night. You can get... It can get lonesome being that busy. You can get lonesome being that busy. Oh, yeah. And I got myself so busy. I was doing one thing after another, which I'm so grateful for creatively, but... Now I've actually been like phoning the team, like management team saying, September, nothing. Hmm. Do not let me say yes to anything. Hmm. I'm taking the month off because it's time to kind of reevaluate that. And with all these changes that are going on in my life. Well, it affects your self-worth. If Hmm. I'm only worth delivering X, um, if I don't deliver X, then I'm worthless. And I think that it becomes such a binary equation and especially in the arts where you are the product, you're not writing something, you're not painting something and then it does the work. It's you every time. You know, that the wonderful thing, I think it's Brené Brown about the man in, in the arena. It's that mentality, you know. Um, it You're giving of yourself all the time. And I think the the, the permission to do that should be a lot more expensive than it, it is at the moment with a lot of people. Oh, listen, for a good six months there, I never went out stage show because I had nothing to give anymore and I needed to protect myself. Mm. And there was uh, a couple of other things that required me not to do that, but I just needed self-care. And mm. now I'm starting to do it again because I feel full or at least in, in more control of my self-care and self-worth. But also you need to evaluate what it is that you're going to give in those moments. I just, it's a thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's great to see all the smiling faces, and I, it's amazing that that support. Look, don't get me started on stage dooring. I I have such a low tolerance for um, a number of things, but I think top of that list is I'm a human being, and I'm thrilled that you're excited by the work, but that's not me. You don't know me well enough to have an offhand familiar comment that actually hurts sometimes. Um, to just think that you've paid the ticket price, therefore I'm included. Mm. My job ended when the curtain came down. And yes, if you go to stage door, you are welcoming a, a few things, but it's not all access. And now that, you know, post pandemic PP, um, the, the, the touching and the grabbing and the manhandling, um, that's not, yeah, it's not okay. My hands are always behind my back now, and just uh, I think it's. But here's what I've learned: is like with grace now as well, because people get overexcited. So I get it. So I have that grace of just like you have forgetting to themselves where, the, a bit. Where it's coming from? Yeah, of course. And that's why now it's just if I hear an offhand comment, I just go, "Thank you for your support." Yeah, Thanks see, I'm support. still working on that. I it, it's so difficult because again, at that point in a show, what people don't realize is you are at your most vulnerable. You are still closing up after opening up for the performance. Mm-hmm. At least that's how I feel about it. And at that moment, when somebody just goes like that, and they've, everything's exposed, it, it hits you 10 times harder. And I think people don't understand that sometimes a reaction from somebody at stage door um, is not diva behavior. It's not arrogance or rudeness. It's just that really hurts. And you are so, you're a bare wire. There's no insulation at that point. Yeah. Somebody's gonna get shocked. That's why it's I just tough. like, it's if tough. I hear something that triggers me, I'm like, in my head, I forgive you. I love you. Oh, you thank you're, you. You see, I don't. I, I'm just like, you. <laughs> yeah. Look, and listen. You've, you, you've learned more in that department. I mean, I'm still. Well, look. I, I get so defensive. I think because I'm well, so excited. None of us are perfect, though. No, but because I'm. Myself s- included. I'm still so excited about what I've discovered and what I think I'm worth now. As a human being. Right, but it doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. Absolutely. But because I'm now fiercely, I now have to. I'm on the other end of the scale now. Before, I was like, you could say whatever you like to be like, oh, thank you. Uh, whereas now, I'm like, no, 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 no. So I'm like the overprotective parent now. So I just have to go back to the middle. Yeah. So before you go out, if you decide to go out, you put your armor on and go, okay, there's going to be some things that I'm yeah. going like, to not like. So let that bounce off yeah. and just it's, kill it's it with hard. kindness. It's hard, you know, because it's... I, I, I just wish people knew what they looked like when they have those moments where they don't think and they just spew something out, um, either about someone's appearance or their weight or whatever, like you, you've, you've got to, and also start out by saying hello. 
just the simple. starting of a conversation halfway through. And again, that is a half turn so a kickbox to the head compliment, not even backhanded, that your work was so um, intimate that they feel they can. That's amazing. But that's still not me. You're not Nikki Arnstein. No. You know. Um, and to start a conversation halfway through sometimes, it's just like, whoa, 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 hang on, hang on. Who are you? Because I might want to know who they are. So it's yeah. just, it's one of those things. But I guess the only thing that I don't like is when they go like, can I photo? I say, no, please. So I can say yes. Well, that's if they say you. anything, as opposed to just shoving a camera in your face. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that happens. Um, but you're still very giving. I looked on your Instagram and, well, first of all, every few sections, there's like a block of six of you. Then there's photos, photos, then another block of six. So when you post, do you post by threes all the time to keep everything in line? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> you want to speak about control freak? What a when curate you I got going on. I discovered it. Uh, we were in Seoul with Phantom. And I discovered that two of those pictures were out by one block. So I had to go into the sections before each one and decide, okay, two of you have to die. <laughs> just to align everything um and then the worst is like you post a grid of nine and it's a headshot or something and you don't realize that one of those photos is just your chest hair and then you get people commenting oh i'm just like no i didn't expect that from you like how are your grandkids you know like what are you doing <laughs> and, and it's it, it, it's a bit of a minefield sometimes, but um, that part of the job is also so tricky to navigate. But where I was going with that is I oh. saw clips of you, I guess, backstage for 40 minutes, taking fan questions or supporter questions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I especially like it, you know, if there's a, a, a theater school in or that, or that sort of thing. Um, because I think because I never studied, I, I'm slightly envious of kids today who have that opportunity. Yep. Um, and I get a bit upset when they sort of don't realize what they have because I think to go into a theater academy in today's world where you have access to anybody and anything that you like. Um, if I was a, a, a kid studying theater in Algeria and I wanted to know what it was like to sing the new the newly returned song in Funny Girl for Nick Arnstein, I could actually message you and ask you directly. When I was starting out, I had to find a way to get to that city to hopefully see you afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's a different world, and the access, I think, is amazing. Um, so any chance that I have to address a group of kids where maybe one of them in that group is the sort of kid that I was, but now they have the opportunity to ask. I'll make myself available. I think it's so important. It's funny. I, I every now and then at stage door, you just you just know like there, there's someone who was me. Oh yeah, you know, young girl, young guy, whatever. You like yeah. speak to them. Something just intuition goes, they, or at least acknowledge them. Yeah, because that is they. If if they were like us, they, they're too shy to say anything. Yeah. And just to be acknowledged, like my favorite thing is when you do curtain calls and you see kids in the front row who lead the standing ovation, um, that's a kid. And that kid was not on their phone for the entire show, mm. which in today's world is the ultimate compliment. Isn't it? You know? Yes. Um, and you, 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 a wave or a wink or Unless something. Unless you're in Japan, it's respect. Well, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, a, a wave or a wink to that kid or that young adult um, it's, it's so important. I want to start doing more of that. I don't n do workshops because like yourself, I never trained. So and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to say, but I feel like now I'm, there's something in me that's like, start showing up for stuff like that. Now but, I don't exactly know what I'm going to say or do, but how can I be of service to them? I think that's some, I can start it as a Q and A because you'd be surprised what you learn in answering certain things. Um, and even just doing masterclasses where you, you know, somebody comes and sings Stars or something next to you. I had a student in Cape Town who sang Stars and um, uh, his name was Asanda. And sort of going through that song with him and then watching how he interpreted it 
was so interesting because then, although I've never been in Les Mis, I have a, a certain understanding of it. And I think from your point of view as a Valjean, in that instance, that's invaluable. I know, but I'm not a teacher and it's, I'm just Neither another opinion. I. Neither am I. I don't think it's exclusive to teachers. Um, you know, by that, by that logic, by your students you are taught. But sometimes I find I can't explain myself. My brain knows what I want to say, but my mouth doesn't articulate it. And I think you need to give yourself more credit. I think you'd be surprised. Let's do a workshop together then. Great. <laughs> and I'll always go, Jonathan, what do you think? <laughs> and I'll riff off that. <laughs> talk more about that. <laughs> Jonathan, It'll talk. Be great. It'll be great, yeah. Uh, no, seriously, I, you know, I, I, I don't make light of that at all. I think, it's, I think that should be part of your... Your, anybody's career in this, no matter what you do. I mean, I was at Kimberly Akimba and J James Lapine and the whole creative team arrive on stage to talk to theater fans who are theater majors, uh, theater virgins, across the board. That shouldn't be a special event. That That's what, part, that, what, what makes this community so invaluable, um, especially in an art form that's all about collaboration. Yeah. You know, I mean... Come on. When you're in Italy, you've got to do that there. But there's no time in Italy. But I want to set up stuff to go back to do it. Absolutely. My I did two it, weeks I, there. I did it in Taiwan. It's going and to be it nuts. was at, at, at the international school. And it was just incredible. I bet that was awesome. You know. And how long were you in Taiwan for? Oh, goodness. I should know this. Call it four weeks. Yeah. See, the problem when I go to Italy is one week of tech and then two weeks of shows slash preview, so I'll yeah. be rehearsing today. So, like, I don't even think I can stage door there. It's just literally show, sleep, gym, show, sleep, gym. Mm -hmm. And I'm back in Funny Girl. But we want to plant seeds to do more over there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I guess we could start doing that here. When you come back here, we can do a workshop together. We'll get be, a studio. I should be back in September. Do, like, make it free. Love that. Love that. I don't need to make money to being a teacher. Like to well, do that sort of thing. That's not my. That's well, in, not my calling. In in terms of, you'd be surprised. Maybe I will charge then. I, th <laughs> I think I, th I think you'd be surprised in terms of saying, well, that's not my calling. I I'm not a particularly patient person. I, I no two questions in, yeah, <laughs> you, you were kicking my ass <laughs> with love and respect. Of course, that's how it was um, received. Yeah, but I I'm not I'm not patient at all. And like initially, I thought, oh, I don't know that I can. But when you when you are in a room with somebody who reminds you and, and takes you back to when you were 19 and all you wanted mm. to do was get this. Um, and, you know, if I think back, you know, listening to Love Changes Everything with Michael Ball, he's got the B flat at the end that he holds forever. And you're just like, how, my voice had just broken. How can a person sing that high for that? Like, this blows my mind. I just want to learn how to do that. And I think you'd be surprised what feeds you when you see somebody understand and then they do it and you see their joy. Like those uh, master classes with Sondheim, if you YouTube them, those are amazing to watch. Because he will say, you know, at least he used to, you know, I, I don't know how much of a teacher I am. And then you watch him. It's just like, yeah, wow. you are. So do it. I think you'd be very surprised. So listen, we've been digressing this whole conversation and... We met in Hong Kong. We should talk about oh, that. Yes. So, so, where, where do we start? So I was doing Evita in Hong Kong, part of the world tour. And there was this buzz. Um, so when I first joined, they said, Ramin's coming in to do Japan, just so that you know. I was like, great. And towards the end of the South African run, I actually let the cast know because you never want it to look like there's this happening. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll never forget, there was a, 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 a cast member called Kiruna. You remember Kiruna? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I was a bit sad to leave the show, but I'm like, that's it. So just that everybody knows, Ramin Karimlu is coming in. And the cast was, it was so interesting. They didn't want to rejoice to make me feel terrible. So everybody went, mm, and Karuna went, what? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> Great, great. But I get it. And again, this ties into what I was saying. A South African, you were just a name on a CD. You're not a person. You're a legend from overseas. Like, 
Come on. The Phantom from the Royal Albert Hall. That's what it's called, right? I never watched it. Uh, <laughs> Neither have I. But you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's a big deal because it, it not only le- legitimizes what we're doing, but there's an opportunity to learn here. So we get to Hong Kong, and by that point, I'm trying to play it cool. Um, and the director, Dan, came backstage and like, okay, so it r- r- remains watching tonight. I was like, okay. Just going to warm up some more. <laughs> get out of here. Um, because it, it is a big deal. You know, there is that, that fear of meeting your heroes in this industry. It can go wrong. And then at the end of the show, we, we met in my dressing room and it was like, wow, wow, wow. And then we went and we had coffee and started to chat. And I think if I think back to Hong Kong, um, the version of myself that I was back then compared to the version of myself that I am now, um, I wouldn't say the same person at all. Mm. Ditto for you. Myself included. And I think um, we met and then we kind of drifted apart again. You know, um, n- not to say that we didn't have things going on, you know, what with COVID and everything. But we didn't... Uh, we didn't. We didn't, we didn't stay keep in touch. touch. No, things things happened. Yeah. Um, so that's why it was it was so cool this time around because obviously I still saw what you were up to, um, but life life certainly happened for everybody. I think. Um, and then I went to see Funny Girl, and and I, I texted you afterwards because I, I do think that that what I saw in that performance was just. And again, I I was like, this isn't the same guy. And that's, that's what I think is so amazing about this job. You can tell exactly how somebody's doing or how much they've grown by watching what they do on stage because that's the ultimate litmus test in terms of honesty. Right. If we're, um, and then we're suddenly having green tea sitting in, you know, what, what, what was that street? Where were we? Up, outside that Starbucks. Oh, Worldwide Theater. Plaza? Yeah. yeah. But here's, here's the thing, it, viewers. Um, <laughs> if you want to have... Uh, a, a you know a tea or something i don't know which is this the right camera to look in it will this be this is a psa um if you want to know what amos hart feels like in chicago have some green tea with raymond caramel over here <laughs> in new york city i'll never forget the amount of people that were like and then that surreptitious thing that people do it's great but the point that i'm trying to make is to reconnect in this city um, as these versions, I think was, it was such a nice, it's not even a full circle. It just, it starts it all again, you know, because, um, yeah, I, I think you should meet your heroes. You'd be surprised what you'd learn, you know, and this isn't me blowing smoke at all. But like I say, I need to impress upon everybody listening um, so this doesn't descend into sycophancy. When you are that far away from this, um, and London and the West End and everything, and there are shows that mean a lot to you, Phantom means to you what it means to me. Um, And you find yourself being the exception to the norm in that role. You certainly were in the beginning. You were so young when you went into it in in, in London. Um, On paper, that shouldn't work, but it did. So... That's that. That's what I think was so amazing in finding out your journey, who you are, uh, relationships with people, the similarities. That was amazing to see, and you know the exception to the rule still works, and which I think is cool. What I love too is whatever time went by, we picked up. Oh yeah, even with these new versions of ourselves, with oh, these yeah. slightly well for me putting the pieces back together. Yeah, and it just felt. Again, we were meant to have that time. But I think having transparent conversation and, you know, addressing it and getting it and then off we go. I, you know, that sort of clean space is always the important thing, I think. Clean space, 100%. You know, um, and I think in a business where it's, I don't want to say it's part and parcel, but um, saying one thing, feeling another is so common in this business Yeah, to just get rid of that. The amount of energy that you have free to do real things with, 
because that takes a lot of energy that that artifice and that pretense that oh, we must do lunch mm-hmm. like come on yeah honesty is far more interesting well it, it, it requires the least amount of energy but bravery as well because like you say we have to put up such oh, a yeah. pre- pretense sometimes because you don't want to upset mm. anyone or you don't want to but then sometimes just being honest with you like oh, I want to work out on my own even if you see a mate in the gym and like it's good to see a man but mm. but you headphones are on it's my time because we know what rejection feels like mm. you know you, you you try and water that down um to your own detriment so as to not make somebody feel bad but your decision has nothing to do with them you know but um i had a friend message me um and they were like oh so like w- w- what do you and Ramin talk about and i was like I cannot tell you that because the majority <laughs> is absolute filth. But what what is interesting is like, I think you and I both share a very dark sense of humor. Yeah. A really f- not dark as in horrible, but just certain things that some people, of are, it. some of it's, some of it's a lot to laugh at, but, um, our, our love of Ricky Gervais. I don't know if I'm allowed to bring that up. I don't know if you're going to lose, say what you want. lose fans. Look, I don't know. Whatever we say um, at some point, someone's going to be upset. Yeah. But they're just projecting their own issues. Well, and you know what? I love them. I forgive them. I have no... I'll never be recruited to hate someone. They'll never be on my heart. You have a line of merchandise. Very soon. That's such a good line. But I, that's the way I Recruited see it now. Recruited to hate somebody. I love that's that. why I'm like, say what you want about me. That's fine. That wasn't a, that wasn't a joke. He's laughing. I don't understand why he's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's much... Why keep that poison on my heart, mm-hmm. you know? It's also... It's, it's that whole thing of like if somebody follows you on social media... And then they suddenly don't like you anymore. And they, and they message you. Just want to let you know I don't want to talk to you anymore. This is like, what are you talking it's okay. about? I wish you nothing but amazing yeah. things. But um, I want to ask you a few things. Yeah, and I still feel like and we're, we need to wrap up. So like very quickly, did you enjoy so, being Phantom? What do you mean did I enjoy being Phantom? We didn't really talk about it. Well, well he's going to cut a whole bunch of that other stuff no so everything's staying so just real Lol. quick fire did you like being phantom i loved being great phantom. did what you, you? love it and i can't wait to do it again exactly so this new production that you're doing yeah um new look completely yeah is this what you wanted to ask me yes carry on because uh, you know i picked your brain about it and i wanted your input on it because there's, there's some of the new stuff which people will see i was like oh yeah i just wanted to gauge your reaction but how are you feeling going back to it after how many years 13 13 years yeah, something like that how does that feel at first, during the rehearsals that we have, we had it privately in this where we are now. Um, the how much, I guess, courage and effort and work it took to unlearn everything, mm. to relearn it, because it's a whole new animal. I'm a different person, mm. and any time I would like do something, and Fede, our director, goes, "Why are you doing that?" And I'm like, and I got to the point where I was just very honest to go, "That's just my instinct of what I did before. Mm. So let's find another way." And if the, going back to that works, then we'll keep it. But let's erase everything so and that for the longest but time do you feel a pressure because of what people remember you as well that's what i was going into and i was just like well i've released that and i talk about letting go releasing surrendering because i'm not going to be that anymore i'm mm. what i am now and my work ethics for as far as i'm concerned is actually better than back then i'm older uh my voice is what it is now, and what does that mean? My voice is what it is now. No, I mean I've. You sound great. What well, I'm not actually concerned about that. I'm with those things I've been doing and releasing this anxiety, this depression I've been in, this. Which ironically, somebody would think would be useful for the character, hilariously. <laughs> but the releasing of that has now released tension all around here, mm. and now I'm really excited because the other day I had to record "Bring Him Home" and anthem with a orchestra in a studio and I was so nervous. I'm like, I don't know if I can do that. And something clicked that day and I was like, Ooh, I found the joy, mm. but it wasn't about the result. So it's this thing I'm playing in my head is like, I need to be in joy to enjoy. But also with that character, you'd be surprised because so much of what he does comes from a place of love and joy. You yeah. actually need a lot of that to inform the tragedy. I think going into play the tragedy with tragedy exhausts you more. 100%. Um, and, and that's what really affects the voice because then you're just emotional all the way through yeah. and everything just begins to like inflame. So as for the pressure, no, I've released that because I know, especially with Fede, our director, we're both such fans of the original and because we 
we're not doing that anymore. We can't do that anymore. So it's no, to kind of preserve our love for that is like, don't touch it. Hmm. How else can we tell the story? And it's still the story. It's still, you know, the lair and you need all that. So it's maybe a different look to it, but it's with the best intentions from fans as well as the actors on oh, stage. Yeah. Like we're as much fans of it as we are in That's it. That's always the problem you know, to guard against that, because I think the sentimentality of that and the power that the show then has over you um, is, is dangerous to, to not um, become an extension of the show. Right. Um, but I just, I, I was always curious because I thought, you know, if you were at the Royal Albert Hall, it was re-released during COVID, it re-cemented um, that box that you were in, happily so. Um, but I, I always sort of looked at that and I thought, gosh, I wonder what that is, what that feels like, because it becomes an unexpected mantle that will be, you know, we're, if we're talking iconic roles, um, you know, uh, whether it's, um, Evita on Elaine Page and, and Patti Lapone, whether it's Grisabella on Betty Buckley, you know, the phantom on you, that's going to be with you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Amazingly so. Um, and then to go back to, I think it's such an amazing, um, active, um, artistic integrity to go back to it completely differently. And again, this is, we I talked about great. calling because I didn't look for it and I tried to talk myself out of it. Even my managers were like, you're actually taking the meeting for this. I'm like, oh, let me go talk to Fede. I like him. And something about Italy, it's a slight homecoming for me because where we escaped from Iran. And I was like. Oh, interesting. So a lot of things were coming in place. And my were whole, you in Italy first? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. So a lot of things in my life, my instincts and in calling has just put me there. And I'm like, well, nothing is saying don't take this meeting. So take the meeting. Mm. And then the next level got to the next level. I'm like, well, let's just keep going. And next thing I know, because I always thought I would never return to it because what is going to top the Royal Albert Hall? And I'm like, well, if there's any way that I can help create something new and get this show back to Broadway, if this is even an opportunity... <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's the theater. They want to book yeah. the show. If there's <laughs> any way like, to be part of that, then I'll give it my best. Yeah. And if me being part of it helps it. But what's the worst that can happen? Well, you see... It doesn't fly? It, at the end of the day, it still goes back to the fact that you still get to sing that score again. Yeah. You know, and that's, that, that's the interesting thing. And it's, I think anybody that's played the role um, and loves the role um, will know what I mean when I say... Um, Anybody can come to you at any point of the day, any year, and say, hey, do you want to sing it one more time? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Well, I hope we can get you to sing it one more well, time too, well, Jonathan, because I'm not going to lie. I've been using you as a reference, preparing See, this. See, that's so weird, because if, if Vota um, and Omar, my, my dresses that I had, ever heard this, they'd, they'd be like, what? Because I was the one playing you, Anthony Warlow, Crawford. Um, I was doing Grease at the time, Danny. And before, you know, we go to, and there I am listening to, you know, I have brought you in the dressing room. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget the Kaniki that I was playing with, um, uh, walked into my dressing room and she said, why are you listening to Phantom? And I was like, because I want to be part of a real show one day. And he was so upset by that. And in retrospect, I look back like, what a thing to have said. Yeah. Um, because it's, to denigrate one thing over another, and that's not what I meant, but, I think the, the the homecoming with that show, because it's that show, if we're honest, has become a an heirloom. People hand it down in their families now. It's not just a show anymore. Mm -hmm. I think that and Les Mis, people 100%. inherit yep. the show. Um, and you, you're never quite finished with it. And all we can do is keep growing as people and artists and yeah. keep doing our best with it. Yeah, just as long as you have the A flat. Do what I can. <laughs> so good to have you on here. I, Thank I you. I feel like... We just only touch the surface. So can we do this again? Yeah, please. The sequel. All right, brother. I yeah. love you, man. You too. We'll